and it uh, records automatically so oh awesome Hi, welcome everyone. Um, we're just going to wait for a few minutes for everybody to join um, and then we'll get started. All right, um, why don't we go ahead and get started as people are sort of um, coming into the, the webinar. First off, uh, my name is Bill Albert and I'm the head of the User Experience Center at Bentley University and I want to welcome all of you to our webinar this morning on telemedicine in the time of COVID-19, a study of the telemedicine experience of both patients and healthcare providers. Um, we're very happy to have you at least virtually here today. Um, and I'm excited to um, have this webinar being hosted by the UXC at Bentley. Um, we're going to be kind of running through our presentation. We have plenty of time for a Q&A. And if you want to um, submit a question, which we encourage you to do, you will probably see it somewhere in the, in the Zoom interface, uh, something that says Q&A and you're welcome to submit a question and we'll try to get through as many as we can. We've again allowed plenty of time to to answer your questions. So um, why don't we go ahead and get get started. Um, just a brief background about who we are for those of you that don't know. Um, we are a UX consulting group based in Bentley University in the Boston area. We've been around since uh, 99, so more than 20 years and we provide UX consulting services 
um, around UX research, design and strategy to all different types of clients, including healthcare, financial services, et cetera. And one of the things that we do is um, we do research as well, and we wanna do research on interesting kind of user experience projects that have the potential to really make a positive impact on society. And that's what we're doing um, this morning is sharing with you some preliminary research on the UX of telemedicine platforms. So we're very happy to have you here. Um, just a little bit about the research team. Um, Elizabeth Rosenzweig is not able to present this morning, but she was really the spearhead for, for this work and did a tremendous amount um, in making this research kind of come to fruition uh, that you're going to see here today. I will be trying to step into her shoes uh, briefly in the beginning and at the end. Um, the work was also done by a whole team of uh, design research associates. Both Desmond and Pridvi are going to be taking over the bulk of the presentation today. Um, and they were supported by um, Jake and, and Kate and Brianna and Marissa, all who um, work in or have worked in the UXC. Um, so a little bit about our agenda, what we want to cover um, this morning. Um, I will just give a little bit of an introduction about what telemedicine is and some of our kind of primary research questions. Um, then uh, Desmond's going to step in and, and talk a little bit about the methods about what we did and then move into um, kind of saying found kind of what we found with the patient experience and the healthcare provider experience. And then there'll be a discussion on personas like who are um, different types of um, um, patients related to telemedicine and their journey maps. And then we'll go come back to some specific design recommendations that can be used in more practical terms to improve the, the user experience around these platforms. And then I will step in toward, at the end with a call to action, some specific things that different organizations can do um, around this. And then we'll, again, we'll have uh, time for a Q and A. Um, so what is what is telemedicine? I imagine most of you already probably have a pretty good sense of it since you've joined this, this webinar. Um, it's really a platform that allows both a patient and a caregiver to interact in real time, typically over video. And the key point here is that there's some real time interaction. Could be over the phone um, or more commonly maybe over something like Zoom or some other type of platform that allows the real time um, video between the um, clinician and the patient. Um, and telemedicine, similar to, to any relationship with, with a physician, it help, helps evaluate, diagnose, and treats patients remotely. So instead of coming into the office or into the hospital, um, a clinician is able to um, evaluate, diagnose, and treat remotely. And of course, this is going to vary a lot by the different conditions that somebody has. Um, and there's certainly many cases when somebody would want to go in to, uh, to a doctor's office or into the hospital instead of having it done uh, via a telemedicine platform. Um, it also allows for monitoring the health of the patient remotely. So there's a lot of new technology that allows the integration uh, into a telemedicine platform. For example, um, being able to monitor a patient's vital signs, uh, whether it's blood pressure or um, their um, glucose levels or uh, oxygen levels, all different things that would help the, um, the physician um, monitor progress in what the kind of current health is of, of the patient remotely. And it, these systems are really complex and, and they're complex for a number of reasons is they need to support really different needs between the patients, you know, which is all about simplicity, the clinicians, which is um, things around privacy, obviously, as well as the patients. Um, and administrators. So a lot of different needs all come into play as well as how different systems integrate into those platforms, whether it's to be compliant with HIPAA 
or um, other kind of back office applications, EHRs, things like that. So these systems are um, very complex, which has created a lot of kind of usability uh, challenges and opportunities. So the future of telemedicine, it's really exciting. I mean, in, you know, from, from what I've, I've, I've been reading is that um, I believe that, that COVID specifically has really accelerated a lot of um, telemedicine. And what COVID has done is a number of things. Um, it has certainly made um, uh, kind of the interaction over video, whether it's, you know, through your work or with your doctor, much more commonplace, much more convenient and certainly safer. Um, it's also created a, no, a new process or um, kind of accelerated the process that um, healthcare organizations have to use um, in order to deliver telemedicine very effectively. And also the underlying infrastructure in terms of the um, specifically the video and, and the platforms themselves. So this has really resulted in, in kind of this rapid acceleration on kind of the future of telemedicine. And you can see here from the quotes, a lot of different um, sources basically being very bullish on um, telemedicine as, as a platform uh, kind of expanding far beyond um, um, COVID. So what is the current experience of telemedicine? Now, we did some research and there wasn't a whole lot out there that kind of compares a telemedicine versus in-person in, in experience. I did find some things um, that were more specific to certain types of uh, conditions or specialists and generally, um, overall satisfaction is pretty high, somewhere 80 to 90% um, somewhat are very satisfied with the telemedicine experience. Um, there's one uh, very interesting study um, that looks at um, uh, how s the satisfaction compares for doctors that are providing um, both telemedicine and in-person versus telemedicine only. And there is basically high satisfaction with care providers um, who are th things around kind of the, the, the people. So, um, you know, efforts to include in decisions and kind of the interaction that a patient has with their healthcare provider is generally very high. You can see up here in the, um, in the, um, the figures that where it does fall short is things around the process like ease of talking over um, video, scheduling appointments, ease of contacting, the audio, the video connection. You know, these are top two box. So basically a moderate to low satisfaction level um, for things related to the process. And um, another thing that this study lays out, which I really like, is, is kind of the key drivers in satisfaction. And it really comes down to three things, uh, according to this particular research study. It's coordination of office staff, like scheduling the appointments. It's the usability and specifically the ease of the video. And it's the quality of the video connection. So the underlying infrastructure, the, the quality of the connection. And those three things kind of in concert are driving um, a lot of the satisfaction where it's up or down specifically the likelihood to recommend a video or a telemedicine experience. And we'll be covering all kind of three aspects of that in our study today. Um, so what are our research questions? The first thing we wanted to know is what is the current telemedicine experience like for both healthcare providers and patients? What are their pain points? What are their points of delight? So what does the current landscape look like? Secondly, what are the opportunities for improvement in the overall experience with telemedicine? What are um, the things that we can do? What are our highest priorities to drive a better telemedicine experience for both patients and healthcare providers. And third, what is the overall patient and healthcare provider experience? Um, what does it look like? Um, so what is sort of um, our kind of North Star, if you will? What are we sort of aiming towards? What, what does a, a, an exceptional telemedicine experience um, look like? 
and both uh, Desmond and Pridvi will be going over the study to kind of lay out these um, three research questions. And just a brief um, kind of brief notes about the study. First is what we're going to be going over is very much exploratory in nature. So this is really our kind of first step just to gain insights into what that current telemedicine experience is like. It is not meant to be conclusive. We're not presenting kind of validated metrics. It is really exploratory in nature. And I can't emphasize that enough. Secondly, we're using a myth, mixed methods approach. Uh, so we're combining both a qualitative and quantitative methods to understand both the what and the why. And lastly, is we're more focused on kind of the broad drivers of experience rather than kind of comparing specific platforms or people with different conditions or different user segments. We really are trying to take kind of a broader um, kind of high level picture as opposed to kind of deep dives into platforms, uh, different medical conditions and different user segments. So um, with that, I am going to stop sharing and I'm gonna hand it over to Desmond Fang who's gonna um, walk us through the next section of the webinar. Right. Thanks, Bill. Can you hear me and see the screen? Okay. All right. So um, I will start with going through the methodologies and some context of the study with you today. So we spend about about six weeks of time on this exploratory research, and there are mainly three parts in this study. So first, we did uh, literature reviews and you know, headline research to understand the history and the landscape of telemedicine, and prior to and during the pandemic, like Bill mentioned earlier. Second, we designed a Qualtrics survey to gather behavioral data. So it targets uh, patients and healthcare providers. and They are the primary user of the telemedicine. Then we reach out to uh, users in both groups and conduct an in-depth interview to better understand their attitude and workflow uh, in their experience of using telemedicine. So, um, there's always limitation in each study. So for this one specifically, uh, we had limited time and resources. So we were only able to recruit a relatively small group of uh, participants. And second, when we launched the study, uh, we were trying to as get as many participants as possible that had experience using telemedicine. So um, the backgrounds like age, gender, medical history, um, health condition, et cetera, wasn't really uh, taken into the consideration. And third is we use our personal network to distribute the study. So most of the participants are living in the greater Boston area. So we weren't able to capture the users in other uh, geographical areas. So, with that being said, uh, there is a need to uh, conduct further studies to validate our findings. So next, uh, let's take a look at the telemedicine experience in patients' perspective. So most of our participant, patient participant encounter telemedicine for the very first time during the uh, pandemic, and they learn about it through uh, different uh, sources. For example, uh, like news articles and from their insurance providers' website and apps. And they also learned about it from their healthcare providers' office. Um, and um, also like uh, the reports uh, about COVID-19 and their workplace benefit managers as well. So to be more specific, uh, in this particular study, only six out of the 50 total participants use telemedicine prior to March 1st this year, and comparing to everybody, which is all 50 after March this year, which is a huge jump. And in terms of the, uh, the appointment frequency, 80% of the survey patients reported that they use telemedicine as an on-demand situational appointment. Only 20% are regular reoccurring appointments. And as for the appointment types, 40% of the 
uh, participants use telemedicine for primary care and 51% for specialist visits. So when it comes to the technologies involved in their telemedicine appointments, um, desktop and laptop are the most commonly used devices followed by mobile phone. And um, one of our participants commented that they prefer using a laptop because it is more comfortable. So they don't have to, uh, for example, on mobile phone, they have to hold it up all the time. And another patient told us that she had to ask for help from her husband to hold the phone while she can follow the instruction from the uh, physical therapist to move around. And as for the aspect of uh, the software aspect of the telemedicine, so most patients use an online portal that connects to the, uh, the EMR, the electronic medical record system for their appointments. Um, so when patients were asked about their current experience with telemedicine, uh, which align with what Bill talked about earlier in the study, uh, we had a really high satisfac satisfaction rate, which is 82%. However, uh, worth noting is only uh, half, only half of, uh, of the participant only uh, rated as a good experience versus a great experience. So that tells us that there is definitely room for improvement. And we will discuss that later. So uh, how about future use? So 62% of uh, the patient participants uh, stated that they were wanting to continue using telemedicine in the future. And it is clear to them that um, telemedicine is not a replacement, but it's a supplement to their current ways of receiving healthcare. So um, when asked about their uh, preference, they, uh, it's an even split between telemedicine and traditional in-person uh, in appointment. So uh, patients said they will make a decision on what would be the best for them based on their situation. So there is no uh, one over another. So one of the interesting insights we found in this study is that uh, patients perceive telemedicine as less reliable than in-person visit. So if you look at uh, in-person visit, overall 94% of participants believe that it is reliable. Uh, well, still 6% of them don't think it's reliable for some reason. And comparing to the 83% of the participants believe that telemedicine is reliable. And if you look at a uh, somewhat reliable part um, for uh, in-person appointment, only 18% of them rated that way, uh, comparing to almost half of the participant rated uh, telemedicine is only somewhat reliable. So uh, we got this uh, comment in our study. Uh, somebody asked, how can an MD assess his uh, patients over a computer screen? Right, so that tells us that there is a lot of work to be done to help patients understand uh, what can telemedicine offers. Also, um, there is a space to design the experience so that we can uh, the patients can rely on this technology without hesitation. So as for the cost uh, for telemedicine appointments, uh, patients reported that uh, during the pandemic and uh, after the federal and state level regulation is loosened, uh, it costs the same amount uh, comparing to their tradition in-person visits. However, uh, some patients believe that the telemedicine appointments is actually cost less. Uh, when you counted uh, everything together, uh, when you don't have to travel and you don't have to spend time on that as well. So as for the benefits of telemedicine, uh, patients stated that there are two major benefits uh, according to their experience with telemedicine. So the first one is uh, definitely the efficiency of the telemedicine. And as mentioned earlier, uh, patients don't have to travel, which is a, a huge up side for them and not to mention that the uh, physical and psychological burden that produced while commute, commuting to doctor's office so they love the fact that they can just uh, get the care whatever they need whenever they need uh, when they uh, can just stay at home uh, they also love the fact that telemedicine is accessible for them so they can uh, make an appointment that fits into their schedule and they can also just see the doctor in a relatively short amount of time. 
Um, so however, when we say it is accessible to patients, we are really talking about a population that is uh, you know, relatively younger and relatively uh, wealthier and with higher tech literacy. So just in this country alone, a quarter of the population that does not have the access to broadband to internet. So this is more commonly known as the digital divide. And that takes us to the limitation of the telemedicine. So as of now, the market, the technology and the infrastructure that's uh, supports telemedicine is still relatively imma immature. Uh, patients mentioned that they need to download different applications when they are seeing different doctors. And also during the video appointments, the latency, the lagging is annoying as well. Uh, patient also complained that um, the communication aspect of the telemedicine as well. So they feel that the telemedicine is uh, they say, they, uh, they call it in too impersonal uh, because they feel like the nonverbal aspect of the communication is not there. Um, the third aspect of the patient uh, complaint is that uh, there is a large portion of the diagnosis that had to be done in person uh, by doctor or the relative, uh, the, or the re related uh, medical devices. And um, in terms of the workflow, not having access or the ability to share medical record is not helping with the diagnosis either. Also, uh, I believe a lot of us can relate it to this. Um, there's just a lot of distraction when you're working from home. You know, the struggle is real. And it is uh, no difference for the doctors, which is understandable in this unique situation, but it's just not professional. One of the participants reported that the doctor seemed distracted and uninterested in her. And the other one mentioned that the doctor sounded like uh, he's calling while driving in a convertible car. So, well, you know, for what's worth, I hope that's a fancy convertible car. Um, to sum up the patient experience, uh, most of patients use telemedicine for the first time during the pandemic and 60, 2% of them would like to continue with it. And a typical um, telemedicine appointment is situational and most likely conducted on laptop and desktop followed by mobile phone. And it's, it is most likely uh, conducted through an online portal that connects to the healthcare provider's uh, record. And telemedicine is perceived as less expensive and less reliable than in-person appointments. Also, the additional training for healthcare provider are necessary. Okay, so now let's take a look at what we learned from the doctors. So similar to patients, prior to March 1st, in uh, the healthcare we talked to, uh, nobody practiced had telemedicine before March 1st, and they were forced to quickly switch to, uh, to hosting telemedicine uh, appointments online fully. And one of the doctor mentioned that their practice went from uh, in-person to fully remote in a week and a half of time, which by itself is just an amazing achievement. Um, in terms of the technology, healthcare provider um, most likely use computer and mobile phone to host the appointment. And based, and based on their specific, specific situation, sometimes they use both. Uh, healthcare provider do prefer patients attend appointment uh, through a video enabled computer if possible, because the computer camera can capture a larger area, which uh, for example, for the treatments like uh, physical therapy, the patients will need to free up their hands and do certain exercises and for uh, in the case of adolescent medicine, sometimes uh, the treatment including screen sharing as well. So the laptop is the most versatile and gives uh, the most versatile devices and gives you the most flexibility. So while rapidly transitioning into telemedicine, most uh, interviewed doctor mentioned that uh, they had no input to the selection of the platform. 
And for some of them, it is just really frustrating because, uh, you know, as they are the primary user of the telemedicine because they will have to deal with it on a daily basis during the pandemic after all. Um, so they also echo, echo patients' uh, responses. They found that the workflow is cumbersome when using the, the various uh, telemedicine platforms. Uh, also, they mentioned that when they encountering the technical difficulties, uh, in order to save time, they will just switch to a platform, a more reliable platform, like uh, just a regular phone call. So, uh, so uh, versus stay on and try to troubleshoot uh, on the platform they started with. Uh, when asked about the preference, uh, their attitude toward telemedicine, a uh, healthcare provider, uh, unsurprisingly, overwhelmingly preferred uh, the, the tradition in-person visits. Uh, they mentioned that, that they can form a more meaningful connection with the patients and they are able to uh, provide the diagnosis more accurately. Um, however, that does not mean uh, they are denouncing telemedicine. So they do see a future for telemedicine the, and the potential of it and uh, the way it can augment the overall healthcare experience. Uh, ideally, they will prefer a hybrid format and uh, telemedicine can help eliminate some uh, unnecessary visits to, the, to their office. So with that being said, uh, moving forward, regulation is something that needs to be resolved uh, before healthcare provider can practice telemedicine sustainably. Uh, they believe that uh, the insurance company should pay providers for all forms of access to care. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, that only, I believe, 10 states in the US uh, pay the doctor the same amount. Uh, for telemedicine visits. So as for the benefits uh, of telemedicine from the perspective of the doctors, so they know the three major benefits. First, uh, without needing uh, the, the patients present in person, um, it can reach a larger population comparing to in-person visits. And second, it provides a higher efficiency for the patients, so the appointment no-show rate is lower. And third, in some cases, for example, like as uh, mentioned earlier, in the case of adolescent medicine, healthcare providers are benefited from the technology because they get to see the living environment of the patients, uh, which in the tradition you no know, visits, it's much uh, difficult for them to get that information. And also there are four major limitations when it comes to uh, for, healthcare, for healthcare providers. First, um, the current communication experience is not ideal. So the doctor uh, noticed that, also noticed that in, interpersonal con connection is not there. Uh, sometimes they find it difficult for the patient to understand the issues. Uh, one of the interviewed doctor told us that she adopted a new approach that she requires her patients to repeat back the issues according to their understanding, uh, which in itself is a effective method, but um, when you're having to do that multiple times a day, it's just time consuming and exhausted. The second lim limitation is pretty straightforward that we are all aware of the some types of uh, appointment can only be done in person. The third limitation has to do with the technologies involved as they are not completely reliable at the moment and uh, the technical difficulties can cause uh, both doctors and patients some uh, undue stress. This is particularly true for the doctors. Uh, as mentioned, they are doing it um, on a very regular basis. And the last limitation is that we touched on earlier as well. So the regulation piece that uh, it needs to be uh, established uh, permanently for a new time after COVID is over uh, one day uh, in order uh, to allow doctors to keep practicing telemedicine. So to sum up the, our finding in healthcare providers part, uh, similar to patients, they adopt 
telemedicine for the first time during the pandemic. And however, as the primary user, they have very little input to the platform and the technology. Um, so they also see the potential and they are open to use it uh, as a supplement, uh, supplement um, service to the traditional you know, in-person visits. However, uh, in order for them to do it, uh, the regulation and adjust and the insurance re reimbursement could be crucial. And next, I will hand it to Privy, and she will share our insights about the persona and the journey map. Um, thank you. Um, I will now walk you through what we did with all the data that we collected and analyzed. Uh, we created artifacts like personas and journey maps now, how these help us uh, is that they help us understand our user groups better and they help us map out all the activities um, done by our user groups and also identify possible areas for improvement. Let's start with personas. Uh, personas are representations of a certain kind of user for each user group. We created our personas based on the data that we gathered from both the survey and the interviews. And we created two personas, one for the patient, who we call the efficiency seeker, and one for the healthcare provider, who we call the reluctant adopter. Uh, we created both of these by looking at what was common across our users in each user group. And for each persona, we focused on their behaviors, their motivations, and their pain points while using telemedicine. Um, let's start with the patient persona. Uh, the efficiency seeker is driven by the efficiency and the convenience offered by telemedicine. As you can see, uh, they prioritize the immediacy of the virtual experience over the benefits of in-office visits uh, for non-life-threatening health concerns, and therefore their use of telemedicine is situational. They see telemedicine as supplemental. They're motivated by the efficiency and the convenience, such as the time saved in not having to travel or wait. And they feel that telemedicine is a good alternative to in-office appointments. Um, they also perceive telemedicine to be a cheaper alternative to in-person appointments. Uh, when it comes to pain points, uh, insurance companies being unclear about coverage was one pain point. Uh, apart from that, patients want to uh, develop a good personal relationship with their healthcare provider, which was uh, difficult using a virtual um, service. And therefore, telemedicine can feel uh, disconnected compared to in-person consultations. Also, internet connectivity issues while connecting to the appointment uh, led to some frustration. Moving on to our healthcare provider persona, the reluctant adopter. They have been practicing uh, uh, medicine for over 15 years. Uh, they feel that in-person appointments are better and therefore they were reluctant to adopt telemedicine. However, they were motivated by telemedicine because it lets them offer immediate medical care for patients and they can continue to practice medicine safely and ethically during COVID-19. When it comes to pain points, the unreliability, for example, um, Issues caused because of a poor internet connection often cause frustration. Also, uh, many of the healthcare providers we spoke to mentioned that communication is harder uh, over a virtual service. And it is a challenge to conduct certain kinds of physical examinations. And therefore, uh, there's a limit on the kind of appointments that can, uh, that can be conducted using telemedicine. Uh, let's move on to the journey map. A journey map helps us identify uh, the different activities that a user does and uh, it helps us identify their emotions during different points in their journey <clears throat> and also identify possible areas for improvement. Uh, let me talk about how we went about creating the journey map. Uh, first, based on our literature review, we created an initial version. Uh, as we conducted interviews with both uh, healthcare providers and patients, we were able to refine the journey map. 
And finally, as we uh, collected more data from surveys and we saw new themes and patterns, we reiterated on the journey map. Uh, so let me give you an overview of the different stages in the, uh, in the journey map. Uh, it's very similar to an in-person appointment. Stage one is the pandemic or the issue onset. So this is the stage where the pandemic hit and healthcare providers had to adopt telemedicine. And for patients, this could be a stage where they develop a new health issue and they need to speak with a healthcare provider. Stage two is the stage where a patient uh, reaches out to a healthcare provider to schedule an appointment. Stage three is what happens during the actual appointment. Stage four is immediately after the appointment where a patient is left with their initial impressions and a healthcare provider documents the appointment. And stage five is the resolution or the follow-up, which is the stage where a patient is following the treatment plan and uh, the issue is either resolved or they need to uh, reach out to schedule a follow-up appointment. Uh, I must mention here that uh, we created these stages to help simplify and explain the journey. And in real life, these activities are not strictly bound to each stage. Uh, let me first take you through the different elements that you will see on the journey map. Uh, we have touch points which represent patterns observed in the experience and each touch point also talks about the emotion that was experienced by a user at a certain point. Uh, the emotion scale was built on a five point system with one being extremely dissatisfied and five being extremely satisfied. You will also see icons to denote the system components for patient platform and healthcare provider. So let's start with stage one, which is the pandemic onset. So as you can see for a patient, uh, they could develop a new issue and request an appointment. For healthcare providers, it is important to note that uh, the arrival of COVID led to shutdown orders and therefore they were forced to adopt uh, telemedicine uh, quickly and urgently. And hence there was some difficulty in adopting this new system and integrating it with an existing system. Uh, we have a quote from a healthcare provider. Uh, they ended up with Zoom because they were working to make a decision extremely quickly in a very short uh, period of time. Uh, it's also important to note that the platform selected was um, selected by the staff and there was minimum input from the doctor themselves. Um, and also at this point, insurance companies were unclear on their coverage and offerings. Moving on to stage two, uh, scheduling the appointment. Uh, the patient reaches out and is informed about the telemedicine option and most of them found it convenient and opted in. Uh, for, most, for many patients, it was a great experience when they received clear instructions on how to access the appointment. But we saw that for some, they did not receive clear instructions and that led to a poor experience. As you can see from our quote, a patient said, I hadn't received anything by the time of the appointment, so I had to call my provider's office. For healthcare providers, a potential pain point is a patient insisting on being seen in person. Another point to note here is that the correspondence between the healthcare provider and the patient at this stage happened over different modes of communication, uh, ranging from emails to texts. Moving on to stage three, which is the actual appointment. We saw that a, a source of anxiety for patients was any delay in an appointment and they had to wait for the doctor without knowing why there was a delay. Other pain points were distractions in the healthcare provider's environment or difficulty in community, communicating. For healthcare providers, the major pain point was not being able to notify uh, their patients if there was any unexpected delay or if they had to reschedule for some reason. Also, very often we found that patients had difficulties connecting to the appointment because of uh, network issues and therefore uh, healthcare providers had to conduct the appointment over call, which was not ideal. Many healthcare providers mentioned difficulty in building personal relationship and ensuring that the patients understood the next steps. You can see from our quote, it's more time consuming for a healthcare provider having to circle back to the patient and check with them if they understood what, what to do next. 
Um, let's move on to post appointment. Immediately after the appointment, we saw that overall patients were satisfied with the experience and they were amazed by the convenience. From the quote, it is incredibly convenient to have telemedicine for simpler questions. For the healthcare provider during this phase, they have to manually enter their appointment notes into the EHR system because currently the electronic health records are not uh, integrated with telemedicine. And also they have to inform their staff to schedule follow-up appointments, which brings us to the final stage, which is the resolution or the follow-up. We found that there was some unclarity on exactly what the follow-up process is. So when patient received clear instructions, it was a good experience, but sometimes they did not receive instructions and therefore they did not know who should reach out to schedule a follow-up. This led to missed opportunities for follow-up. From a patient quote, we see, except for the follow-up, every part worked. There needs to be a little connection and the process has to be made more like in person. I would now like to highlight uh, the areas for improvement that we identified. One, there was unclear communication about accessing the appointment, which led to a poor patient experience. Two, there was lack of a clear checkout experience. There was no clarity for patients on what to do next. Sometimes they did not know whether the prescription was sent to the pharmacy and the mode of communication varied. Three, there was a lack of a clear follow-up process and uncertainty about who should initiate a follow-up. And also for healthcare providers, it means there was no way for them to track their patient's progress and to resolve any issues. Uh, I now hand it over to Desmond to talk you through the recommendations. Thanks, Ravi. So next up, I would like to talk about our uh, recommendations to improve the future telemedicine experience. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this study is a exploratory research, hence our recommendations are formative. So with that being said, let's take a look at our recommendations to improve uh, the overall uh, telemedicine experience. So uh, in this stage one, uh, as for the technology adoption, so in the language of uh, UX professionals, we often said that uh, discoverability is the prerequisite condition for usability. So uh, with that being said, in plain English, that means you have to be able to find it in order to use it. So the first step of improving the telemedicine experience is to make the offering and the technology more discoverable. So communicating and educating patients are important. So they need to understand what telemedicine can offer, what the providers offers, and how can they get one if they need to. So how do we achieve that exactly? To help people adopting the technology, they need a little bit of nudging, a little bit push to make the decision to use telemedicine. So we could start with uh, advertising telemedicine as an option through different channels. So the patients are aware of the telemedicine as a potential option for them. Second, an AI chatbot can answer questions and help the patients determine if they should use the telemedicine or go to the doctor's office instead. Third, it should be easy and obvious for the, patient, for the patients to schedule an appointment through different channels. So this process is important in the overall experience. Uh, emotionally charged emotion, uh, memories often come out first as we recall our past experience. So we don't want the patients to feel frustrated and lost in addition to what they're already suffering. The second stage of the journey is about informing patients and setting their expectation for the upcoming appointments. Two, create a clear uh, appointment confirmation. Similar experience can be borrowed from, for example, the online ticketing site. So right after you buy the ticket for the event, and in this case, setting up an appointment, you, will be, you should get a clear confirmation of the appointment details with the time and date. So also, why not just also include the calendar invite so the patient can just uh, add it into their calendar so they don't have to take an extra step to do that. 
Also, it is important to include information about how to attend the appointment. For example, uh, the clickable link to the session or the link to download a specific app and make it clear to the patients if there is a uh, device requirement for their appointment. Um, like, uh, for example, if uh, the requirement will require a laptop or a desktop, or is it okay just to use your phone? So, you know, we don't want the same experience happen to one of our participants that uh, during their uh, physical therapy session. Um, as for the setting uh, expectation, it is important for healthcare providers to have an additional uh, information like a Q&A or informational videos about uh, telemedicine in general or things to expect in your telemedicine visits. So the patients could learn more about it if they want. And last but not least, a reminder email a day before the appointment is also a nice and human touch as well. And um, as we talk to our patients, um, they find some parts of their experience uh, during the stage three uh, is confusing and not matching their expectation. So uh, let's do uh, a little exercises. How about let's try recalling the last time you introduced something new to others. Can you remember what uh, and how did you approach it? Um, so my guess is first, very likely you will bring out something that is already exists and likely known to your audience in order to make it relatable to them so they can understand what you're talking about. And there's no difference here when it comes to telemedicine. Patients are looking for their past relatable experience. So we recommend to translate the physical experience as much as possible so the process is intuitive to the patients. So how do we do that exactly? We uh, imagine a virtual waiting room experience for patients right before their appointment with the doctors. So for example, for the first time users uh, of the technology, uh, they can log on to their session and enter the virtual waiting room a little bit earlier. And uh, like ad additional information such as uh, instruction on, on testing out the camera, microphone, or the instruction on how to set up their device will be available. So they can minimize the possibility of having technical difficulties during the session. And it's also not unusual that the doctors are running late from the previous appointment. So the patients uh, are anxious without knowing that. So it is important to provide information for the patients. Uh, it can be as simple as a notification saying that the doctor is running late, or it can be advanced as an AI power time board that shows you the doctor's schedule and how much longer is the delay. Um, to make also to make the experience less nervous and more enjoyable, we even propose uh, putting entertainment options like music play playlists, uh, sport sports highlights, or a news channel, uh, etc. So the waiting experience is less unbearable, and the wait time can be perceived as less. Uh, also, uh, one of the uh, major complaints from both doctors and patients toward telemedicine is that uh, they feel the interpersonal connection is not there. So uh, one feature that would dramatically improve the experience for doc both uh, doctors and patients is an AI-powered speech-to-text function that integrated with the telemedicine platform and the electronic medical record. And why is that the case? So um, human has very limited attention span. So we are not very good at multitasking. Even doctors, probably, they are probably the, mo the smartest amount of us. They, are, they have no exception. So by utilizing speech to text technology that will record all verbal communications between the doctors and the patients, it will free up doctors' cognitive load during the appointment. So they can focus on their attention on communicating with the patients. It can also save some time for the doctors uh, after the appointment for uh, all the necessary documentations as well. So similarly, uh, checkout is the other area that can be improved uh, by mirroring the traditional in-person experience. So uh, let's try recall your last uh, in-person appointment, which is probably over uh, six months ago now. 
uh, after you're done with the doctor, usually you will be sent um, to a staff member and they will help you with uh, like the billing and the next set up the next appointment and answer uh, whatever questions you might have. So, and why can't that be the case in for telemedicine? One of the participants mentioned that uh, her current experience after the appointment feels like a separate transaction. A virtual checkout experience should wrap it up for you and answer questions you have and make it experience complete. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, go cool. on. I have to keep my mask on. Uh, hopefully you can still hear me. Okay. Um, so things are still moving behind the scene after you finish the telemedicine appointment. And there are some opportunities here to improve the experience, which is uh, could be similar to e-commerce experience. So if you were prescribed with drugs, uh, what if you can track the status of them on your phone and get a notification when it's ready for you, right? And so why, uh, why we stop there and then this, we, we can even dream bigger about uh, how about we can get the drugs delivered to you. So if you already feel terrible, wouldn't it be nice if you can just stay in bed and rest? You don't have to go out, go to the pharmacy and pick up the drugs and come back. So uh, the last stage, uh, which is where telemedicine will come in as a full circle and there should be a clear process so either patients or healthcare providers can initial a follow-up appointment. So to be more specific on the patient side, uh, artificial intelligence could send uh, patients a follow-up alert a few days after the visit to check if their issues was resolved. So if they got better, uh, if they got better that's great. Uh, if not, how about scheduling a second appointment right away? So on the healthcare provider side, uh, artificial intelligence can trigger a automatic reminder to check in with the patients. So before I hand it to Bill, I would like to share this image uh, we found uh, while doing research about the history of telemedicine. This is the radio news magazine back in uh, April, 1924. So on the cover, it is the very first concept uh, of telemedicine that go into us. So if you look in detail, uh, you will be amazed by the accuracy of their imagination. So human has been practicing uh, impersonal healthcare for thousands of years now. And it is uh, the current uh, traditional healthcare is set up as the standard way of delivering care uh, with the assumption that um, the patients will be uh, in person, will be presented. While telemedicine, the only, the very first concept was only surfaced in the last 100 years ago, and it didn't get massively adopted by the patients and the doctor until now. So while the limitations are obvious at the moment, as I just told you all about it, the potential of it are even more exciting. So we started to see the technologies like uh, 5G, like artificial intelligence, AR and VR, and even blockchain reshaping our life. Telemedicine has a huge potential to become an important part of the healthcare experience in the future. So really, sky is the limit. And uh, next, I will hand it back to Bill, and he will uh, bring us down to back, back down to earth and then talk more in detail what exactly we can help with improving the UX of the telemedicine. All right, thanks, thanks, Desmond. Um, okay, so let me share my screen for a moment. Okay, so um, thanks for walking us through that. As, as Desmond said, uh, I wanna make sure we, we're gonna uh, wrap up the presentation with our, our feet on the ground here um, through a few very specific calls to action. What are our next steps? So the first thing is for the research. I think that this, this is an area that is just beckons for additional research, specifically running large scale quant research with a good cross section of users, different types of caregivers, people with different medical conditions, different platforms. Um, 
and focus on pain points, unmet needs, barriers to use. As I mentioned before, this was very much an exploratory study and um, uh, doing a, a much larger scale quant study would, would really help us validate a lot of the, the insights, the metrics that Desmond and Pritvi uh, showed earlier. The second thing is doing more in-depth qualitative research to really better understand user behaviors and start to build kind of a, a design best practices around telemedicine applications. Focus on the why that will really drive those insights. Uh, for example, doing a longitudinal study to see how people use telemedicine over time would be extremely insightful. And then the last thing is really a call to disseminate this research. That's what we're sort of trying to get the, the ball rolling on this. We want to improve the telemed experience for all people, right? Not just patients uh, or caregivers, but everybody involved, all different types of medical conditions and situations. So dissemination of this work is extremely important. Um, in terms of platform providers, um, there, you know, if if you work at a a, pro, a, a platform organization, um, we really recommend doing some kind of usability evaluation to see what's working and what isn't on your platform and then to build out specific design recommendations. And this is usually done through, you know, iterating a design, evaluating, measuring, and iterating it again, and going through that cycle. So um, I think it's extremely important that if, if you are responsible for, in any way, shape, or form, the design of uh, a platform, that you go through extensive usability uh, testing and lastly is really look at that end-to-end -end experience. Um, with Pritvi's talk, going over the journey map and, and the recommendations that Desmond laid out, you can see how it's, um, there's a lot of different moving parts and it's important to kind of look at how that experience goes from the onset of an issue all the way to follow up and looking at that end-to-end -end experience will really improve the overall telemedicine platform, especially um, from the healthcare provider perspective and how other systems integrate, other technologies are used. Um, so um, these are some recommendations that we have for providers. Um, so with that, I wanna open it up to your questions. Feel free to use um, the Q&A function to submit your questions and I will sort of curate these questions and pass them off as needed and um, I'll let me take the first question which is what's the point of using a journey map that's a wonderful question and let me put it very succinctly a journey map is a really common visualization of that end-to-end -end experience to see um, what are the different um, activities, the different touch points, the different emotional experiences? And by laying it out visually, all those different steps, we're able to kind of easily identify those pain points and what those opportunities are. So we can see for different personas and use cases kind of um, um, where their particular problems. So we can sort of diagnose, uh, okay, this is a problem here when the person is trying to make the appointment, but is, you know, something like that. So um, a journey map is extremely helpful to visualize um, kind of what that experience is like for any persona and for, for different use cases. I hope that answers your question. Um, the second one I want to pass off to, to Desmond or Pritvi, feel free to jump in. Um, you briefly mentioned that telemedicine gives doctors new insights to patients. Um, can you talk a little bit more about this? Uh, sure, I can go first. Um, so as uh, I mentioned briefly uh, in the presentation that uh, it's not like all types of uh, uh, medical uh, telemedicine appointments will be able to offer that. It's usually some type of uh, uh, appointments that we learned uh, in our study. One of them is the telemed uh, the adolescent medicine. So for uh, teenagers and for young kids, uh, 
uh, the doctors will be able to see, you know, like what their household is like, like who they're living with and what their uh, living environment is like. So uh, from the uh, traditional experience, like uh, there's no way that the doctors will be able to capture that uh, amount of information. Uh, you know, the kids uh, won't be able to deliver that to you. And from the parents, it's just, uh, it's just take a, take some work to do that. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, the next question is um, the ideas you have presented around AI are very interesting. Do you think some appointments may become entirely AI? Again, I want to pass this off to Desmond and Prithvi to weigh in. Uh, okay, uh, I will take that too. So I think that is a very interesting question. And to be honest, I haven't thought about it, but I wouldn't eliminate the possibility of it. But the thing with the AI is that you need uh, to train it a lot, like a lot. And you need a lot of data and you need a lot of tuning. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done for that. But, uh, you know, one day, who knows, right? Uh, we don't know. We won't know what was like in 10 years. So entirely uh, with AI, maybe some simple questions for sure. Uh, but yeah, that's an awesome question. Yeah. Thank you for that. And and I'll just jump in here. I, I, I do think that at some point it for certain um certain cases, um, AI is gonna play a bigger role. If you think about AI as, you know, a set of algorithms and algorithms are, you know, basically a recipe or decision tree, and that's essentially what a lot of physicians do, asking you a certain series of questions and ruling out um a different possible diagnoses and, and honing in on what a potential diagnosis is. I do think AI is going to play a role. What that role is, how long it will take, I have no idea. Um, but, you know, I, th I think it is sort of inevitable that it's going to come into play at some point in some way. All right, that was a great question. Um, what will be the potentials of applying wearable devices at home for um, physical examination. Um, let, let me jump into this and then Desmond or Prithvi, feel free to follow up. Uh, I think it's already already there. I mean, we, we actually, as one of our clients a couple of years ago, we worked um, on um, different wearable devices and how it connects to um, 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 a, a telemedicine application uh, via Bluetooth. So things like um, um, the, um, you know, blood pressure, weight, um, all these different vital signs that were, were connected via Bluetooth and being essentially uploaded on a regular basis. Um, so I, I think it's, it's already, already here. Um, it's probably going to become more more prevalent, I think there's always a challenge, especially with older adults um, who've got, um, may have physical challenges in terms of using these devices, but also um, we saw a lot of usability issues around how these different devices and platforms all kind of connect together. Um, so there's no doubt going to be some challenges there, but I think it's it's already um, around that. It's, it's already here. Um, Desmond or Pritvi, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so wearable, uh, I mean, right now at the moment, uh, their telemedicine also, uh, their also application of, uh, like Bill mentioned, monitoring. So uh, I feel like with, you know, everything is possible with the advancement of technology, right? So as we just saw, uh, I think it was last week, uh, Apple just added the blood oxygen uh, detection in their new Apple Watch. Uh, even though right now uh, they 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 can be used, they uh, the data it collects can really be used for medical use. But I believe in the future there is definitely 
uh, you know, wearables device can play a part uh, to help with the telemedicine experience. Great. Um, did you learn anything about access barriers for people with disabilities? Great question. Was that Pridfi or Desmond? Did 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 uh, did you collect that data? Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able. That wasn't so. Uh, that wasn't part of the scope for this study. But uh, so yeah, so we didn't get to uh, do that part of the study as well. Mm -hmm. And and as follow up research, I would highly kind of encourage when I talked about different uh, different populations, certainly people with with disabilities is a really key element to to consider as part of this um, as uh, this research. Um, kind of a related question is about um, did user experience vary by age? Did older patients have more difficulty using the technology and less likely to use telemedicine. So do we see much difference in um, age group? Is telemedicine something maybe for, for younger people or um, or not? Um, so in terms of what we have, what we know from this study, uh, we can answer that question for sure. Um, but we, uh, we did like during our conversation with one of the doctor, uh, he did mention that uh, with the older, like much older patients, uh, he mentioned the age is above 75. Uh, the, that population had really difficult time using telemedicine. Um, but, uh, you know, cause uh, we like for the study uh, per se, we weren't, we didn't really collect uh, the, the, the patient uh, demographic data because of, uh, I believe, HIPAA, uh, the HIPAA compliance uh, uh, prohibited us to do that. So that is uh, a good question for a different study. Great, thanks. Um, what about this one? This is, uh, what insights were you most surprised to discover during this study? What really jumped out at you guys? Um, I could take that. That's a great question. Um, I think this is something we mentioned before, but um, some healthcare uh, providers that we spoke with really emphasized how how great it was to look into the environments that the patients are calling in from, and that gave them a different perspective, which is not possible when you um, visit in person. So for me, that was a very interesting point of view. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I would just add that uh, also, like, because going into the study, we will, we will feel like uh, this is a new technology. So, you know, people probably don't feel like it's a, it's a good experience. But surprisingly, a lot of people think that's already a, a good experience. So, like, uh, further study, we need to discover why that's the case. So that's that surprised us a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so th this one, you mentioned HIPAA. Um, this question is, do you have information on implications of HIPAA privacy laws when there are people in addition to the patient in the hearing range during the appointment? So, uh, you know, I think that's something that telemedicine kind of creates a potential uh, problem or challenge around is people within the earshot of this appointment as it relates to HIPAA? Were there, did you find any data either in the study or in um, your literature review around uh, privacy issues around that? Uh, not exactly, because uh, that's a really good question and a very specific one. But uh, for this study, uh, we weren't really focused on the, the HIPAA uh, compliance uh, so we are really trying to understand, uh, trying to learn the whole landscape of telemedicine. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and all right, so a few more questions have kind of been popping in here. Um, 
there's been variable adoption of quote patient portals. Do you think improving patient use of these portals will assist widespread adoption of telemedicine? Um, I'm happy to take that or if you guys want to jump in. Um, so my, my take is I do think it will um, accelerate the use of telemedicine. I think as more people become more comfortable with the patient portals, I think as the por patient portals are better designed, giving a better experience, it lends itself really nicely into a transition into a telemedicine appointment, right? So for example, if you're, I use my patient portal and I use that to schedule an appointment, I don't even call. Um, and if it says, hey, would you like to come in next week or you know, are you available in a few hours for a telemedicine appointment and it's something very simple, I might opt for that. So I definitely think that the, the patient portals will, will be sort of a, a nice gateway into, um, into telemedicine. Yeah, uh, I agree what Bill uh, mentioned. Um, but also I feel like uh, that I feel uh, the, the, the usability of the portal is a, is a important factor, but other factors like the cost of telemedicine uh, is also like very important to the patient as well. If it's more expensive, uh, why would they use telemedicine? They would just rather go to the doctors in person and that will definitely guarantee, you know, uh, everything. So that's another aspect. Yeah. Um, all right, great. So, so this next question um, uh, is, I don't know if you saw in any of your literature review, um, do you know anything about the no-show rate for telemedicine appointments? Is it greater? Is it less? Do people show up more? Yeah, I could take that question. Um, we spoke with healthcare providers and uh, when we spoke with them, some of them mentioned that the no-show rate is definitely lower. And going back to the example of a, a mental health care professional working with adolescents, uh, she specifically mentioned that, uh, that she used to have a no-show rate before, like a higher no-show rate. And now with telemedicine, it's so much con more convenient for, uh, for her patients to just dial in from home. And so the no-show rate has been much lower. So I think that's, that's a win for telemedicine. Great. And, and that's something that we'd certainly would want to get uh, much more extensive data on to see what the, um, uh, how the, how the, um, the no-show rates compare uh, for in-person versus telemedicine. Um, kind of circling back to HIPAA for a moment, the next question is, um, I like the idea of recording the virtual in, uh, appointments and sharing transcripts with the patients. Are there any HIPAA concerns around this? Does it depend on how the information is shared, whether it's a HIPAA compliant platform? So did, in your interviews, did, did, did people talk about um, either recording or sharing transcripts with the patients? Desmond or Prithvi, did you get any of that data? Um, so, we we didn't we don't have that data specifically uh, within the study, but uh, we starting to see uh, there are some companies that provide that uh, services, and uh, and we starting to see more and more doctors starting to adopt that. Uh, so when we were talking about uh, the transcript, uh, uh, we are not talking about like. Uh, specific talking about uh, sharing with it other people. So I guess that's, um, I don't, I don't, maybe it, that, that's the, maybe the HIPAA won't allow that. And then that's just for the doctors to, uh, you know, easily reference what they talked about during the, uh, the conversation. So they, the, the doctor don't have to, you know, um, type and then talk to the patients at the same time. So that's the, mm -hmm. the main uh, idea behind the recommending using that type of technology. Great. 
Um, okay, let's see, uh, a couple more here. Um, do you know how widespread use of video communication is and does this vary by age or other demographics? Is this a, a gating factor in the adoption of telemedicine? Um, so, so basically, I think what they're asking is um, basically how comfortable are people with vi video communication? Does it vary by age? And I mean, that, that's such a kind of critical element of telemedicine, right? Um, how does this vary by age demographics? In any of your interviews, did people talk about or did you see in any of the quant data about kind of comfort levels with video communication? So, so yeah, that's a great question and that's a great uh, research topic as well. But unfortunately in this study, we weren't able to collect any of the uh, demographic data from the patients. So uh, I won't be able to answer that question, but uh, on, on the other side, uh, telemedicine, there are also other formats of telemedicine. So for example, there are also text-based uh, uh, primary care. Uh, so you could just uh, text the doctor and then send them pictures if necessary. So, uh, but yeah, for sure with the video uh, communication, it's not just a, a higher requirement for the device, but it's also a higher requirement for uh, the internet. So as we mentioned, uh, there is a, uh, there's a digital gap. So there is still a large population don't have the access to that. So, uh, uh, in terms of that, uh, that's, there's a definitely, a, it's definitely a gating factor from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Uh, why don't we make this our last question? Um, why are you so confident about simulated intelligence? Uh, I assume it's like artificial intelligence. As of today, most of the people try to av avoid bots and look for human interactions, I assume. Um, so I'll, I'll, let me take this first and then if you guys want to jump in, um, I'm not super, I, I, I'm notoriously kind of a bad predictor of the future. So take that for, <laughs> uh, you know, that's my caveat there. Um, but I, I, I do feel reasonably confident because bec people are becoming more, um, comfortable with different forms of whether it's, uh, conversational interfaces, um, uh, different AI that we're having in our homes and our work um, as we're interacting with businesses, it 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 seems ripe for disruption. I think I think it's going to kind of slowly um, become a little bit more present in the healthcare industry. That's just my take on it. I am I'm a a user researcher. Uh, I'm not a physician. So, um, so I, you know, I'm sure other people will have different opinions. I don't know, Desmond or Pritvi, if you want to weigh in. Uh, sure. So, um, you know, like healthcare, uh, there's definitely a lot of, uh, potential for healthcare. And as Bill mentioned, the AI is starting to, uh, filter like in uh, like infiltrating into our lives and then you know people it's it, it it's understandable that people uh are afraid of uh not afraid but like uh not so sure about the new technology that's totally understandable um but the thing is uh we always trying to do things a little bit faster a little bit better uh that's always the case and AI allows us to do that. And uh, right now, a lot of uh, people researching AI, they are, what they're trying to do is not, you know, just developing something that has, they have no control over. So what they were saying is they wanted to create AI to help us, uh, but under the control of the developer. So uh, AI is really uh, to provide extra help here is not trying to replace everything. Great. Thank you. Well, um, I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, please reach out to us if you're interested in working with us. Um, visit our website, uh, email us, Twitter, social media, and all that good stuff. Um, thank you so much for, for being uh, part of this webinar today. All your great questions. I hope you found it useful. 
and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Probably to end meeting for all. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye guys.